Okay, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining me today for the Salesforce uh, event log monitoring session. My name is Prakash Reddy, and I'm a principal pre-sales solution engineer here at New Relic. Uh, before that, I was a consultant at staples.com. And before that, I was a developer at CA Technologies developing monitoring solutions for almost 10 years. Um, for the past five years, I have been leading the data ingestion efforts at New Relic during which I've created more than 100 integrations and extensions for New Relic infrastructure and APM agents, bringing valuable metric, trace, and log data from various third-party sources into New Relic. Today's talk is based on one such integration that I've authored more, uh, very recently, which brings Salesforce event logs into New Relic. Um, I'm sure you must have seen this a lot of times, so I'll just skip through. It's a standard safe harbors statement. Um, the, a brief agenda. In this session, we're going to talk about the need for Salesforce event log monitoring and then go uh, into a bit of detail about New Relic integration and its architecture. Then we'll do a lab in which you will start an interactive Instruct Lab session in which we will download, install, and configure the New Relic integration. We will use a simple developer instance of uh, Salesforce that I've created for you. You're free to bring in your own uh, sandbox or even production Salesforce instance if you choose to. And after that, we will explore the event data in New Relic. For this, we will be using the New Relic University account that has been set up with New Relic staging Salesforce environment. So now let's dive in. Why do we need Salesforce event log monitoring? If you are here, that's probably because Salesforce is a key part of your of your customer facing tech stack. And as developers, administrators, DevOps, or managers, you're putting a lot of effort into developing visual interfaces and backend components, either using FX or JavaScript and a variety of other technologies on the Salesforce platform. You may have to deploy third party packages and develop customizations that, although tested and debugged, can be a bit of a black box when run in a production environment. It is natural to have questions uh, around what your users are actually doing on the platform, what the hotspots in your code are, what errors are your, are your users encountering, and how do you know if your users are completely satisfied? Salesforce event logs are a great answer to these questions. It's rich, granular, and the foundation for all analytics on Salesforce platform. It is useful to think of most of these event log analytics as classified under three high-level use cases. In the first use case, we are asking questions around the performance of your production Salesforce instances. Salesforce event logs are organized by the type of user interactions that resulted in the event, as well as the time period in which that event occurred. So event logs are categorized as event types, such as Apex aggregation type that contains all the events triggered by using any Apex class. And a log with event type of lightning errors, event type, contains all the errors that occur within your lightning components. The second use case helps you track user activity occurring on your platform. Event types such as login, logout, and report uh, export are populated as these login, log, logout, and report events occur. You will then be able to query what pages the users are visiting more often and what data they are, ex they are exporting and who's logging in from there. The third use case helps drive user adoption by breaking down the usage of these applications by the type of users using them and other attributes of interest. Most of these events contain user ID, the event types contain user ID and other useful attributes that we can use to facet our queries. Since it's uh, uh, it helps to look at this whole thing visually. Let's take a quick look at the architecture. Here we have uh, Salesforce uh, users, end users, trying to log in and uh, use their uh, access their applications um, in the Salesforce cloud. Uh, and as these things happen, uh, Salesforce application servers are writing events to application logs. These application logs reside on ephemer ephemeral cloud infrastructure and as Salesforce is a multi-talented environment, administrators cannot access these logs. So in order to pro provide access, 
Salesforce event log service, if enabled, copies all these events that belong to your organization to your Salesforce database under an object named event log type, event log file. Now these events can be queried through the API using Salesforce object query language, just like any other standard object. The New Relic integration simply uses the Salesforce API to query the event log file object on the API, either hourly or daily, depending on the frequency set for the generation of these logs. You will also notice that this copying process or event log generation is not real time. It does collect rich, granular, highly granular, in fact, data for over, a 50, for over 50 different event types that represent different user interactions. But it takes a few hours for it for, for the, for, uh, to be able to uh, get all these things working in the background uh, to, to, to be put into the database. Uh, Salesforce tends to use idle CPU times to do this, uh, to do this uh, uh, background process, to run this background process. So that is the trade-off, rich, deep, granular events, but the whole process has some processing lag. Most of the lag, most of the logs do become available in about three to five hours after the events actually occur. And in some cases, it could take up to seven days for the events to be added to the event log file. That is the maximum time that Salesforce guarantees that all the event log files will show up. Event logs are also they are very useful to build analytics and insightful dashboards. But for alerting, you will need something else that can offer real-time events. That is provided by event streaming feature of Salesforce that publishes a subset of events that relate to security to the Salesforce event bus. Neuralink also has a, another integration uh, for the event streaming called the event streaming integration that can subscribe to these events. I will share a link to that integration, uh, which is also open source and available on GitHub later in this talk. Going back to the event log interact integration, here you can see a sample Salesforce object language query in the screenshot that is executed every time the integration runs. The integration adjusts the from log date, uh, that is the time which the uh, which follows the greater than symbol and the two log date that follows the less than symbol. These times are adjusted to the current time interval. The response from the query returns event log files containing all the user interactions that occur during that interval. Like I mentioned earlier, you will get an event log file URL for each event type representing the type of user interaction. Following the URL, you can download these event log files, which are in the CSV format. The integration automatically processes these CSV files and converts them into new rate logs or events depending on configuration settings. Generally, you would want to prefer events as they are uh, much better graphable and chartable. Of course, you'll also need to be able to authenticate to Salesforce before you can run that query. So listed here are two OAuth flows that pertain to server-to-server -server interactions. The username password flow uses the password and consumer secret for authentication, whereas the OAuth 2.0 JWT bearer flow uses signatures with a private key that is registered during the creation of a connected app. The Neuralink integration supports both these flows, but strongly recommends that you use the JWT bearer flow as it does not expose any passwords. The integration is built as a Python 3 application and so requires the Python 3.8 uh, or later on time. Of course, one or more Salesforce instances to monitor with an appropriate connected app for authentication and a new relic account with account ID and license key are also a prerequisite for this integration. With that, uh, let's go through the lab portion. We are ready to begin the lab portion of this lab. We will spin up virtual account, virtual machines using an instruct uh, uh, lab, and we will go over the installation and uh, configuration of, of, of that integration. So let me check uh, briefly where the chat is so that I can put that uh, link in chat.
So in this lab, you know, a high level overview, we are going to do an installation and configuration. We're going to kind of download the integration which is available on uh, Neuralink Experimental, it's open source. And so we're going to download or clone the integration. Uh, then we're going to create uh, uh, a Salesforce connected app uh, and uh, use that for this integration. And then we're going to configure and test the integration. And the link to the lab is right here. So let me go ahead and copy this thing. Okay, thank you, thank you, Luke. Um, that is the GitHub link, but this is the instruct link. Please go ahead, click on that instruct link to start your lab. And uh, I have put in all the instructions you will need right into the instruct lab. So it's kind of one in uh, self-contained lab. You can go ahead and use your own uh, configuration information, your own Salesforce. It's all cloud, so. We should all be able to seamlessly connect both Salesforce and Neuralink are cloud-based uh, providers. But I have also created test data with all the test credentials right there in the lab uh, for you. Let me know if there are any questions. I will give you about uh, ten minute, uh, five minutes to finish challenge one, which is just checking all the prerequisites, making sure everything is there and then move on to challenge two, which is the actual configuration and the testing and possibly even setting it up as a cron tab, cron jobs rather, using cron tab. Feel free to request help in chat if you need any help or if you have any questions. As this is being recorded, I will also uh, do this uh, myself too now for the uh, benefit of people who are uh, going to watch the recording. So to start the lab, we just click on start the track. And since we have it hot started, it's going to start up immediately. We're going to click on start. 
And we are first going to check the prerequisites, uh, following prerequisites. Uh, we have created the image, the virtual machine, so that these prerequisites for Git and Python 3.8.x, including if installer, uh, are already installed. So all you have to do is just check the, the whether Python 3 is installed and what version, and check its version to make sure that it fits our needs. And uh, like I said, we already pre-installed Python 3.8. And once you do that, you can uh, you can basically git clone the lab, uh, or you can download uh, the uh, uh, source code or the, or, the, or the build package from the GitHub repository. And uh, the link is some somewhat like this: github.com slash neurelic experimental. New Relic Experimental is where all of our integrations lie, or at least most of them, uh, that are field integrations. New Relic uh, is where our product integrations lie, but New Relic Experimental is where most of our field integrations reside. And this particular uh, repository is called New Relic Log Salesforce Event Log Five. So I'm going to get clone with that. And that was pretty fast. So we have that folder created for us. So now we're just going to change into that folder. And make sure that uh, once we do that, we can just check you know, that there are all these files. There is a uh, config. YAML.sample that you have to make a copy and make a config.yaml or doc. The requirements contain all the dependencies. So if you just take a quick look at requirements.txt, a whole bunch of requirements, packages, dependent packages. Uh, and SRC contains the main pack, uh, the main file and all the other files that comprise this uh, integration. Uh, it is Apache 2.0 license. And there's a helpful readme as well that contains pretty good information, all the information you'll need to run this application. So we're going to run Python 3 minus M using the pip installer. We're going to install and uh, if need be upgrade all the, uh, the dependencies in the requirements.txt file. Once having done that, we are we have set up this application now, this integration now, integration application on uh, on an own host. And uh, now all we need to do is kind of configure it so that we configured it to uh, for it to monitor uh, all the Salesforce in instances that need to be monitored, um, as well as a new Relic account, uh, so that it can then post those uh, events uh, to new Relic. So uh, I'm not going to do this part here. This has I've already done this part, and this is typically done by administrators, uh, at least the connected app creation. It's relatively straightforward, and uh, it's uh, not a. It's quite trivial to set up a connected app. Um, like I mentioned in the presentation, you can either use the. Uh, you can just use the OAuth username password flow and so you need to collect the password but that's not what we typically want messing around with passwords so instead uh, you could also create a private key and uh, uh, enter the private key into the into the connected app so that we can then use the private key to create a signature which can then be verified instead of a password so that's what we're going to do in the in the, in the, in the next uh, challenge. So for this, the prerequisites section is done. So we're just going to click on check, make sure it's all good. So because it's it's all done correctly, we're going to we're going to move on to the next challenge, which is configuration and the testing of this integration.
So for the configuration part, we have, uh, we again uh, can change into this folder, which is where we downloaded all, all the sources. And here we need to edit this file, the config.yaml. And as part of this thing, I've already copied the, the copy from the sample to config.yaml. Um, and instruct also provides a better editor to edit this. So I'm just going to uh, view those files through this editor and uh, access the config.yaml file. This is how it looks like. Uh, it kind of looks very much like an on-host integration that you guys are all familiar with. And uh, integration name, which is anything. This is the service part. We, we are now going to run it not as a service because we're going to set up a cron tab, uh, have this thing run as cron job. That's typically how folks prefer to do. And uh, the interval of uh, execution is typically 16 minutes for hourly logs or uh, 1,440 minutes for a daily log. Uh, you can configure one or more instances here, one or more Salesforce instances. It's, of course, YAML. So uh, a hyphen starts each item. Each hyphen starts an item. So we just have one item here. We're going to connect to the to my, uh, in this particular case, I'm going to connect to my uh, developer instance. So all production instances are login.salesforce.com and all developer instances, sandbox instances typically have test.salesforce.com. We just ch change uh, this to login because uh, developer instance is a production Salesforce instance. And as far as auth is concerned, we're not going to use password. We're going to use this, uh, you know, the JWT data token. And we are also going to have to, so if it's password, then we need to supply client ID, client secret, user, and password. But since it, we're going to use JWT bearer flow, this part is going to be completely different. It's all in the readme, so we can certainly go and take a look at the readme to get this snippet. So we need for the JWT bearer flow, uh, of the grant type would be that. And the client ID, and instead of uh, consumer secret, you will have a private key. This key is then used to location of the private key, and this key is then used to sign the a, a token that is generated. And uh, Salesforce is, will then be able to verify that signature, and it also has a copy of your private key, so it's going to be able to verify that the right has indeed been signed by this private key, and thereby. Uh, authenticate uh, and provide you with an access to it. So again, username in the case of a JWT is going to be subject. Subject is nothing but the username of the user who's going to log in, try to log in. Um, and then the audience is again, it's login dot, uh, audience is either login.salesforce.com or test.salesforce.com depending on your instance. Now you can certainly enable the cache. It can either be true or false. Now, the advantage to enabling the cache is highly recommended. Uh, although, if you do enable it, you do need to provide a cache in the form of a Redis server. So, you kind of have to provision a Redis server and provide this information as well. We're not going to do this here, so we're going to uh, keep it as, as false. But if you do set it to true, then you can run this uh, you know, instance any number of times, and it's going to store all the previously uh, uh, process logs so that it's not, it, it doesn't, it can even reprocess the logs and, and only uh, selectively uh, send to New Relic those new log entries that have been added in each log. And uh, to do that reprocessing of the log, you have to use the created date, which we're not going to do, but uh, if you do have that, this would basically give you pretty close to real time processing of events as quickly as they're generated by Salesforce. Uh, but this requires, of course, you know, um, a cache to be enabled to true, a cache server, basically. 
Um, again, this can be hourly or daily regeneration interval. It's uh, what you set up in your Salesforce instance, whether you want to Salesforce to generate uh, event logs hourly or daily. So you're just going to provide that here. Time lag, as I said, even event log files are not generated in real time. It is separate subset of events which are considered criticals that are uh, generated, uh, are streamed rather, uh, in real time. But that's only a few of them, especially security related events. Uh, and we have a separate integration for that. For this integration, it's not real time and it's going to, you know, you need to set up a lag of, Salesforce typically has a lag of up to 300 minutes for most events to come through. So 300 or even 200, you know, 240 or something like that. Uh, three to any, anything from three to four hours, three to five hours would be a good time to make, to, to give to Salesforce to make sure it has put in all the populated, all those events. And uh, you can obviously, you know, as you're sending uh, events or logs to New Relic, you can populate whatever else, you know, for each event you're creating. You can suggest, uh, you can you can request uh, through the use of these labels, addi any additional labels you want to be decorated to all those events or logs. And this is completely up to you. You can put it whatever, you know, I can, I can even call it. Uh, And finally, the, we come to this new relic section. Uh, you can choose to send these events that are being processed as either logs to new relic uh, that appear in new relic logs or as events that appear uh, for querying under new relic insights. Um, I choose to use events because events are much more, a little bit more, uh, especially the numeric ones can be graphed. I think that's the only difference between uh, logs and this uh, numeric uh, attributes cannot be graphed with. Uh, uh, with logs, uh, because you don't have that restriction with uh, events. But it's just a personal preference. You can you can certainly have this as logs if you want. And again, helpfully, because we have uh, US in our data centers, you have to give an appropriate URL. You can certainly give the full URL, but uh, you can also give the short form US or EU or EBJ uh, for the different data centers instead of having to remember the whole URL. And finally, you have to provide a account ID and license key. This comes straight from uh, uh, from your from your account that you have. So this is going to be my account, and uh, I'm not going to type in my license key here, but I will do that. Once I go here, oh, let me just do that. I can publish. So with that, we have successfully configured the Salesforce part of it, uh, the connection data, as well as the New Relic API keys. We are now ready to uh, to test the integration. Terminal is not working. So let's make sure my okay. So I'm good. Now we're ready to test it. And in order to test it, we're going to run it from the command line. And uh, we're just going to run the, use the Python 3 uh, application or 
the language runtime and invoke the source src slash done domain dot py file that's the main file so we're just going to do that and if you do that it's going to run the query right every time you run it you run, it runs the query and it's going to query for all these things and we have the log date is as you can see today is november 3rd so it's created november 3rd so now the time now is uh, at least according to greenwich mean time it's 16 11 and uh one hour before that, or uh, the time right now is 17.30 to 12, and one hour before that is 16. So it's going to uh, create a two time of now and from time of an hour from, from now. Uh, and there are no events at this point time, and then you're not going to see any events because uh, this is a developer instance, not much activity has happened. So just for testing purposes, just to make sure, you know, to pick up any events, I'm going to change it to a day, 14. 14. And if you run the same thing again, you'll see all the events that, you know, it's going, to, it's going to change the query to run now to yesterday almost at this time. So now you're going to see some events, you know, it's going to be formed under the login event type in a couple of events, log out an event, and a whole bunch of REST API queries. It's kind of, you know, I was using this for my own testing. So uh, most of the time I'm kind of, you know, running these API calls. And there's a little bit of commerce usage as well, commerce application usage as well. So all these things do go to my uh, thing. However, I have kind of, you know, uh, because uh, to get a little bit more data than uh, the test environment, uh, later we'll actually explore uh, all the uh, events uh, from a from a, from New Relics, uh, one of New Relics staging uh, boxes, sandboxes. So uh, ideally, you would want to set it up to run it every. Uh, so I'm not going. To, you know, once you do that, you, you, and if you want to automate this and run it every 60 uh, minutes, uh, you want to change that thing back to 60 minutes, uh, and then set up cron tap, uh, a cron job to run every 60 minutes, and then uh, it's going to keep on running. To do that. Uh, you kind of want to create a cron script file, which I'm going to do that with this command. I'm going to echo this, this little bit of cron uh, cron job description. It says that I have to run it in the fifth minute of every hour, every day, uh, using this particular script, uh, Python. And I've, I've kind of give the whole path uh, because this thing can run, there's no set folder it runs from. Uh, so I have to give absolute paths rather than relative paths. So that's the domain.py script file. I also have to give minus minus config there parameter uh, because it, since it's running from another thing, it's not going to be able to find the config.yaml un unless you pro provide the folder in which to look for that. And this minus minus config there parameter uh, provides that information. And I'm just going to, you know, uh, write this to this this file called anot cron schedule.txt. So now, uh, if you look at it, the cat that anot cron text.txt. Uh, that's basically just a single line, right? Now you're, you're able to do a cron tab. You're going to, so. At this point, there is no cron tab minus L. There is nothing here. So we're then going to run cron tab with this particular text file and uh, set up that one liner. So if you run cron tab minus L again, the list again, you're going to see that this has been. So now it, it is going to run it every hour. Uh, of course, we're not going to shut this down after an hour, but in real life, that's basically, you know, you, now you're done. Uh, uh, you set it up to run every thing, and it's, you know, uh, Come back tomorrow. Come back whenever uh, you will see these logs showing up in, in your right, as it is. Um, so this concludes our uh, the configuration part and the testing part and the setting up as a cron tab and all that good stuff. So at this time, at this point, all you have to do is basically, uh, you know, go back and check on your logs and do the wonderful analytics that you always wanted to do. So with that, I'm going to just check. Uh, you know, check make sure everything is good. And uh, I'm going to exit this back. Okay. 
and I'm going to share the Okay, presentation. Okay, so here we are. We have just finished the lab environment. back. And we also tested it, we ran it as well, we completed this task as part of that lab. And now we're ready to explore the event log data that, uh, that, that this integration provides. Um, like I said, I've set up another instance that uh, we're going to use. And feel free to log into this link this particular account using these uh, credentials. And you will be able to see the dashboards that have already been created, what type of data, and feel free to play along with uh, those dashboards. Feel free to create new uh, queries, new dashboards. Uh, and uh, there should be some bit of data. There's still not a production instance, so you'll not see everything, but a uh, little bit better than, uh, better than a developer instance. I'll give you five to few minutes, five minutes to kind of uh, click on these links and go over the existing dashboards. These are the pre-created da dashboards. Uh, we'll quickly go over some of them. Um, but again, you know, there's a whole bunch of information that event logs provides, 50 different event types. And each event type has a ton of uh, attributes. And a lot of them are performance attributes. Uh, so it's, it's really up to you to kind of you know, uh, go over and, and, and uh, configure them to your satisfaction. Um, but at a high level, we have a few dashboards that we give you out of the box. Um, one of them is the performance overview. As you can see, you get a good view into the Visual Force get requests and the Visual Force post requests broken down by, look at the query. Uh, it's basically from the Visual Force request event type, it's selecting the average runtime, how much, how long it took, how, how fast it ran, how long it took to run. Um, since one day, pass it on the page name. So these are all the page names. And this is how much time it took, and that's in milliseconds. So this would be 11,000 milliseconds or 11 seconds, that kind of you know, ordered from the 
slowest to the highest. Um, and of course, you know, we are filtering on um, get requests in this tab and uh, post requests in this side. Um, so you can, it's actually going to get the top 50. Uh, you can see that all here. Um, similarly, you can um, check in on your Apex classes uh, using this query. You can, um, so to get uh, the performance on Apex classes, Apex execution is the event type that you have to query. So from Apex execution, you select you know, how many count of stars, basically each time it's invoked, each time uh, uh, that class is invoked, um, it's going to put in an event. So you just make it, you just count the number of rows um, again since one day, and you're going to pass it on the entry point. Entry point is the Apex class that was invoked. So these are the FX classes that are invoked in our you know, staging environment. And uh, this is uh, this is how much, uh, how many times it's invoked. So triggers, you know, they're the most invoked, followed by the record trigger on this thing, um, as well as a percentage uh, of, uh, of that. Uh, this is just uh, uh, visualized as a pie chart. And then obviously, visualize it as a different type of either bar chart or a line or something like that as well. Uh, again, uh, this is a much, much more, uh, this is, you will get you a whole bunch of uh, information from that FX execution again. It selects the average number of SOQL queries that, that cloud, you know, as part of that invocation, how many SOQL queries were uh, invoked from that particular class, what is the average runtime, what is the maximum runtime? Sometimes it's not enough to look at the average runtime. You also want to check on you know, if there are any outliers um, that are taking too long. So that's the maximum runtime. Um, also, you can, uh, you can look at the execution time and the maximum execution time as well, the CPU time and the maximum CPU time. Uh, again, all faceted on the FX class, which is the entry point. And so you get this table um, of all the different type of uh, classes that got invoked, how many SQL queries, Salesforce object language queries it made, how much time it took to run those things, how much average execution time, maximum execution time, CPU, how much did it take, and what is the maximum CPU it took for that particular class when it ran, and so on. Um, and of course, you want to keep an eye on your Apex errors. So errors are logged to a different event type called Apex unexpected exception event type. So from Apex unexpected exception, select exception message, exception types is one day that gives, gets you all the errors. So you kind of keep track of um, all the errors that uh, have happened. Of course, you can always go back 24 hours or you know, complete the time and all that stuff. And you can also check on, you know, user engagement, right? We talked about those three user uh, use cases. Uh, one was performance, one was engagement. Um, and engagement, you kind of tend to use the same things, you know, uh, for this particular uh, chart I have, I'm checking in the lightning performance where all the lightning events, every time a lightning interaction happens, an event is put in here. Uh, with all the performance data, but uh, you can certainly uh, create a chart for performance, but this is about engagement. So we're going to uh, facet on the, you know, on the browser name or some such attribute that you want to check, you know, uh, its usage on. Of. Uh, so this will give us, you know, which browsers are your users accessing these lightning, uh, lightning apps from. So. At least in our sales, in our staging environment at Neural, it looks like most of them use Chrome, a little bit of Edge and a little bit of Safari. Um, again, you can check on, you know, what page entities, uh, you can look at this query, what page entities are most often invoked uh, so that, you know, you know how much usage uh, a certain page view is, is getting, right? Um, or you can also uh, run a query for, you want to check on how many, how, 
how much uh, traction is a certain apex class getting and how, how often it is getting used you would basically say from apex execution select you know you just change this to apex execution and uh, change the facet to whatever is more relevant for the apex execution and so on so it's kind of you know reproducible uh, or repeatable for a whole bunch of event uh, event types and here we have uh, pages most visited so all we did all that's changed from here to here other than the visualization is by by chart and bar chart is in this case we are passing on the page application page application uh, whereas here we are doing on the page entity type and here we are doing the page app name. And looking at this thing uh, here we are actually getting into performance so we're going to uh, see the sum of duration of how much you know uh, summed up you know all the time that they spent on this particular page app name, uh, so in this particular app, right? Um, Lightning app. So, Neuralink sales, uh, they spent you know, here, they spent 38 seconds on this particular, during this particular time period on this particular app. You know. Again, this is uh, staging, so. Uh, you would get massive numbers here, but in production environment, you would get a lot more. Similarly, the third uh, use case was about you know, counting uh, checking related user activity type, you know, keeping an eye on user activity. This is actually a little bit, I'm not very, uh, I mean, this is these are these events are login, log out, and some of these events are also captured by the event streaming. So you would want to go and check out the event streaming integration. Uh, and uh, and look at them them in real time rather than uh, although you could do with this uh, uh, and uh, you kind of will get an idea of you know how your logs are doing over over a greater period of time rather than just uh, uh, but but still you know uh, some of these uh, security related events uh, you're better off with doing stream integration because it gets your data much much quicker. So again, um, you would, you know, if you want to build your own, you can obviously come here and create a new dashboard, add chart, and so on and so forth. But if you just want to play around, you can also query your data here. So you can do it from, and then you, you get a list. Even if you don't get a list, you know that these these uh, event types are exactly the same event types as Salesforce event types. So uh, you should already be familiar with them. Just look up uh, in Salesforce what the event types are and uh, just type them. The reason why I say sometimes these won't appear is because of the delay. If you have a big delay, Neuralic is only, you know, for, for command completion, it's going going to only look at the last 30 minutes or, or an hour. Uh, it's not going to go back. Uh, for, the, for the purpose of command completion, it's not going to show events that haven't been received in the last hour. Uh, so don't panic if the things don't show up here, they still exist. Uh, you just have to manually enter them. So, for example, you could do an execution and then select and then average of, and, you know, it's time next to DB total time. And since one day ago, and time series, we will run. And so, on you get that, right? So, it's fairly simple. All you have to do is now change this to something else, a call out time, and then you can run a different uh, graph of. Oh, my color times are good. Um, you can even pass it on something and so on, right? Uh, pretty easily break it down by uh, whatever uh, attribute you want to further break, break, the, break the down by. So that's all I wanted to show you as far as these uh, queries are concerned. And we are kind of, you know, already 50 minutes in. So we kind of, I think, did well uh, move, move through, through these things. Uh, quickly, um, so yeah, Renly, uh, Renly, sorry, uh, you probably the, these these da these dashboards will be provided by Neuralic out of the box uh, as part of uh, right now. Um, so let me uh, first go to.
Okay, so the GitHub link is here. So this is where uh, this is github.com slash neuralic experimental. And as I said, you know, uh, this is where most of our field integrations reside. And you get all, all the stuff. Um, and this is good enough for installation and all that stuff. What we are now working on, which we just uh, announced very recently, is instant observability. And you can actually look at look for that here as well. Some of these field integrations, uh, we are still you know, build, build it, and then we work on the dashboards a little later. So at this point, we don't, we don't have dashboards, but we're going to put in some dashboards here as, uh, as we make them and uh, as we publish them. It's going to take some time for us to publish it. This is a very new integration, like I said. Uh, it's, it's brand new, made in the last one month. Um, so this is where you would look for dashboards if you need uh, you know, dashboards. And that is the case for all of these integrations, right? So with that, uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. Um, and one final thing, uh, I wanted to show was about these other integrations, right? We talked about the event streaming. So, going back to the presentation. Okay, so these are the other integrations. Uh, again, you, you do need to go to this neural experimental site, the same site which uh, on GitHub and query on Salesforce, and you'll get a whole bunch of uh, Salesforce-related integrations. The three things that are kind of popular and well done is this event log file, event logs integration, and then the other one I was talking about, the system integration, the event streaming integration, which brings in real-time events. And then there's also an integration for monitoring browser-related interactions, um, and that is this one right here in our browser. So please do go and check out all of these integrations. Uh, and of course, uh, you would want to check out other integrations too on the Neural Experimental site. That's one resource to go to this Neural Experimental GitHub site, as well as the Developer IO site for any added documentation and dashboards, uh, out of the box dashboards, and so on and so forth. So with that, uh, I think uh, this is. Uh, This is all I wanted to talk about. I'll take a few questions with a couple of minutes remaining.